So welcome everyone to Adventures in Eco Relations, where we have conversations about the personal relationships that humans can have with nature elders and the adventures that can unfold. My name is Danalia Castell, and I'm the host of The Listening Field. And we define nature elders as any nature relative that you consider to be older and wiser than you. So they can take the form of, uh, but not limited to, a beloved tree, a body of water, a mountain, climate, mm -hmm. someone from the fairy realm, one of the elemental masters. So we have many, many, many wise relatives. And this definition, of course, is just a term of respect that we offer to all of them. So I am here today with a very, very special guest, Teresa. Tessa Teresa, excuse me, <laughs> pardon me. I am multitasking as a Zoom tech and the host at the same time. So I'm going to slow down and I'm going to uh, spotlight Teresa and also myself and bring us both online. Here we are. So welcome, Teresa. Um, Tessa, God, I keep calling you Teresa. I wonder why that is. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good, Danny. <laughs> That's funny. And it's your last name or a second first name? Maybe no, you could explain that right off. <laughs> sure. Um, actually, Teresa is my name, is my given name. And, you know, Tessa was for short. So Teresa is actually a name that I put aside. I didn't want to be a, a saint. I didn't want to be likened with Mother Teresa growing up. I just wanted to be a wild child, actually. But just in recent years, I have started uh, reclaiming the name, hence, you know, placing it with Tessa. So you're, you're on, you're right on target, Danny. All good. I'm, I really wonder because I don't usually make those kinds of mistakes with people's names. So that's very cool. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so Teresa is in Fiji and, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about you. So you're an indigenous water keeper, an earth lover, an artivist, and, um, you have this, uh, special relationship with, uh, mother Pacific ocean, uh, but in the South behind me is, uh, the North Pacific ocean, uh, at Quatsino Sound. And so we're here to learn a little bit about um, your early childhood and your relationship with nature. So this is all brand new territory uh, for me with you. And then also about this beautiful journey that you've undergone with Mother Ocean uh, for the establishment of the marine sanctuary of where you live. So, yeah, please. Um, I'd like to just really um, uh, to pause for a moment and recall how special I consider our connections that we first met I uh, first heard of you uh, after uh, the seven days of rest uh, 2021 and I came upon your sharing of this story that you're going to share a bit of today as well and uh, and then I reached out to you, invited us to meet. And rather than go into a uh, conversation, I was guided to invite us to meet in a ceremony. And there you introduced me to your beautiful, beautiful Mother Ocean and the Sacred Rocks. So I'm so thrilled uh, to have this time with you here today. So welcome and thank you for making time on your holiday schedule to be with us. Thank you so much, Danania. As I mentioned earlier, as you played your introductory song, a downpour. So we're surrounded by rain. So not surrounded by water, not only the great mother ocean right here in front of me, but the sky waters are here with us. Um, so I hope the sound is okay. That's like a chorus in the background. Thank you so Perfect. much for, um, yeah, inviting me into the space to share my journey. Um, I just wanted to say, though, that you did um, introduce me as an Indigenous water protector. Um, yes, I am Indigenous to this earth. I am, my, my ties are with the 
Fiji Islands as well as Samoa. Um, however, my practices are not necessarily tied to an indigenous practice of this land or any land for that matter. It is very much just through my willingness to participate what I receive and what I practice. It's not set on some sort of, you know, <laughs> guidelines from anywhere. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that distinction. And, and certainly almost everyone I have on, on this Zoom cast and myself as well, um, we are all what I would call direct listeners and, and, and in partnership, uh, listening to going direct, listening 360. So thank you for that distinction. I appreciate it. So can you tell us and tell me, because I don't know the answer to this question, a little bit about what it was like for you as a child and, and were you always in communication and communion with, with Mother Earth and nature around you? Um, well, I suppose my childhood was very much like many others. I grew up in a city, well, a super city, maybe by, by Fijian standards, which would probably be like a tiny town for you, um, into a big family of seven, six girls and one boy, um, however, always felt to be in the fringes rather than in the family proper. I mean, I had a beautiful, loving upbringing, um, but not only in family, but also in other situations like schools or groups of people always sort of felt to be not quite part of the pack. So more like the black sheep or white sheep, depending on how you look at that. Um, I always found myself playing either in the mud or up trees. Um, <laughs> that was my safe space. Um, so we didn't, we, we, weren't, we weren't poor, but we didn't, you know, we had all the normal comforts of a, of a childhood, but I would prefer to be modeling with mud rather than playing with dolls. Um, and found, you know, just found myself to be very much at home in those places, in those natural spaces, rather than in a, you know, in a, in a closed in area. I understand. I, I, I really hear you. And I think a lot of people who are either in this Zoom room or be watching this uh, feel the same way. Um, I myself was called by a grandmother willow tree in the creek at the bottom of my street. And that became my home, really. I, that's where I felt um, my, my relatives were. And uh, at, at that point uh, as well, um, we weren't where well, there was some telepathic communication, but mostly, mostly our being together just felt like I fit into a web, that I had a place that I didn't feel when I was in my, my human groups. So I can totally understand that. And so when did you come to live on this part of the coast? Because that's specifically the bay where the, where the coral reef was in need of you. Mm -hmm. So my work, um, most of my working life um, was in the arts and I was creating public mosaics in swimming pools and in public areas. And a lot of that work um, happened in resorts. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's where I was being taken to, to little hotel resorts along the coast or on little islands to make art for their rooms, whether it was paintings or, you know, whatever, fabric art. And then, but the mosaics were the big one. And so I would have to come out of the city and come down to the coast. And I had my babies and I, you know, so I was going, my, one of my first jobs, I was like eight months pregnant and the job was two months long. So I was almost giving birth on the job site, which was very much in a construction type area. The hotel was being built. I was laying the mosaic on the floors. And, you know, I, I continued to do that. I had my babies working. And then I realized um, more and more of my work was taking me away from home. And I did not, I wasn't comfortable with that. I was actually taking my, <laughs> taking my troops along with me. And then I realized, look, I don't want to do this anymore. So I decided to move out of the city down to the coast so that after work, I could come home come home to my babies. And it was the best decision I've ever made. Beautiful, beautiful. 
What first alerted you to that there was a problem with the coral reef? What what was going on that that you began to become aware that uh, mm. something wasn't quite right and something needed your attention? Mm. Um, so let's see, what was it almost 20 years ago now? No, sorry, not 20, 15, 14 or 15 years ago, we moved out of the community on the coast and away to a, a big stretch of land, beautiful place. Uh, you know, I still wake up every morning and think, oh my God, do I really live here? Is this really mine to caretake? Um, so from where I'm sitting now, if I, I look out, I look out over the ocean and um, almost every morning, I would see um, our bamboo rafts, we call them Billy Billy. They would come, you know, they would come over the, almost over, not over the horizon, but just before the reef break. And I'd see two or three of them sort of gliding over the water. And it was just such a idyllic scene for me. And I, again, you're like, oh my goodness, how blessed I am to be in a place where I can see my people go out into the ocean, collect food for their families. And it just made me feel like, wow, I really am in an Iteni, an Iteni in Eden, a garden of Eden. Um, however, <laughs> so this scene that I would watch, you know, every other day, as I began to really look, really look at what was going on, because I could see these, these mounds grow on the Mbilimbili way too fast than they would if they were collecting shellfish. And so I really looked at what they were doing. And then I could notice the action that was taking place. You know, so it, it was like an aggressive action. It was this boom. And even though it's, you know, what is it? Like 300 meters from where I am, but I could see the violence in that. Mm -hmm. And so it made me very curious what was actually going on. That is not how you collect shellfish. Mm -hmm. And so I started to investigate more. I would go down to the beach and excuse me, I will, I, I can already feel the emotions <laughs> coming up. Um, but that's not a bad thing. In fact, that is a superpower and I will explain that later. Um, and so what I came to realize was the truth of what was actually happening was this incredibly violent um, action taking place where our reefs were being harvested and harvested in a, in a dreadful manner. So there was a practice of live rock harvest. And before I came here, it had been practiced for some 35 years where the villagers would go out into the reef. And this is only one place that I'm talking about. This, is, this was happening all along the coast. They would go out to the reef and they would literally smash into the live rock, which is the building blocks of our reefs. And they would, pull chunks out, you know, pile it up into the billy billy. And this, this was all being exported to the United States um, for aquariums. And it was shocking um, the amount of coral and live rock that was being hauled out of the ocean every day. And it was just heartbreaking. It was more than heartbreaking. I felt like the more I, the more I exposed myself to this, the more I was feeling like I was being raped, like I was being, I was being mined. Um, and it was just, it was shattering. Um, but it. That's how we. Tessa, were you the only one at that point who was like noticing or remarking on this, like? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, it had been a practice for some 35 years. However, I, you know, I live quite away from community and we do have our experts in the area, you know, marine scientists, conservationists, and, um, you know, people whose walk it is to be active in that manner. And especially on these different levels that I certainly don't operate on, you know, I'm advocating through government policies and that sort of thing. So that was also happening um, in their own realms. However, the, the practice had been going for 35 years and, you know, it was completely legal. Um, yeah, so the more I looked, the more, it was almost like I was addicted to watching them and feeling it and feeling it and feeling it. And then how could I stop it? And so I did try, I did try avenues going through the right avenues 
of approaching the villagers and trying to talk to them. And, but I actually, it made it, it made it very difficult for me living here because number one, I'm not from this place. I mean, I am from this place, but I am not of the land owning unit. I'm a woman <laughs> and I'm Kailoma. I'm a, I'm a mixed blood, you know, I'm not 100% from this clan. So it just made it very uncomfortable for me. Um, and because this had become their livelihood, like their fathers had done it, their great fathers had done it, and it just became like part of their lineage almost. Um, do you want me to carry on? Because it's quite a story. I might be babbling on for a... <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just wanting to check. Is there someone who is unmuted who's on the call? Oh, let's just see. Sorry, I was just hearing some, some noise. I think okay. Richard. Yeah, let me just, I'm just trying to mute him, but um, maybe Richard, you could mute yourself, both of yourselves. <laughs> 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 both of yourselves. Okay, beautiful. Hmm. So perhaps we could... Um, J jump to there's a couple of photos that you've provided of some art pieces that you made so maybe you could we could look at one of those and maybe would that segue us to a a, a point where you were becoming active in a different way absolutely um, okay. okay let me just do this here whoops sorry yeah So tell us about this. Tell us about these beautiful. Hmm. Um, so this, this was my therapy to, that really helped to deal with the trauma that I was feeling. So when the harvest would come in, there was a certain quota and that of live rock that would be um, accepted for export. So they might bring in, say, if one big, mound like this would come in maybe three quarters or even half of that would be expected so there was a lot accepted so there was a lot of discard and what the discard was was it wasn't just pieces of rocks and coral but they were like little worlds because they were full of different types of organisms you know there were tunnels with borers they were all sorts of just life and the pieces themselves were multicolored. they were pink and purple and green they were just gorgeous um, but the longer they stayed on the beach, they all became bleached and they turned completely white. And they, to me, they were a graveyard, you know, bones, bones of the reef. And the more I looked and immersed myself in that, I began to see the beauty of it. And, you know, just these star bursts and, and there's just so much beauty. So I began to collect the pieces and bring them up to the house. And my husband was like, oh my goodness, what is going on with you? I mean, he could see what I was going through and wasn't really, um, you know, wanting to encourage it. And then when he saw me hauling the pieces home, it's like, what is going on? But anyway, so I, I surrounded my studio with these pieces and, and I began to create with them. So I made this series, what I call sea gems, and I called them sea gems because what was coming out of them were um, visually beautiful. And, but the story behind it was, was quite violent. Um, and so I said sea gems because yes, they were from the ocean, they were from the sea, but sea was also, it had a double meaning. It was to see through, to see through the trauma, to see through the, um, through the um, you know hurtful experiences and to look beyond that to the beauty that is also present um, so I was making these and I took them I, I exhibited them here and in Australia and was making a, a decent living out of them but I knew that there was something more so inside these sea gems were have like a um a polystyrene styrofoam bases which is also collected off the beaches and so they floated and so I would take them down to the ocean and just float them and just float them and and um it was 
Yeah. It was just my way of letting Mother Ocean and letting, letting all of the creatures of the ocean sort of know that I felt differently. That, excuse me, I need to take a moment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> let's just take a moment because um water is rising in me too and often too when this happens i can feel it's waters talking so i think that that mother ocean is just really appreciating um what you did and that we're we're here to witness it with you so whew. And we know and that, that through, the, through the waters in our own bodies, mm. each of us who are here and listening and present and witnessing that we are, we are connected with her and all of the creatures that live there as well. This is part of the, the remembering, right, that we know is happening for us as humans, that we are waking up to this interconsciousness and interrelatedness with we have with them. Hmm. I wanted to ask you, did you tether them? Like the ones that we saw that looked like they were in the bay, were they tethered as like flotation markers? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm curious. Did they, did they become a permanent kind of residence in the, the sanctuary itself? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, at first I just let them float and do their thing because it was, also entertaining for me, I was playing and I was bringing some play into this. Um, but then, yes, I did tether them. And then what I did was I sunk them. I sunk them underwater and then I attached them to rocks, you know, and under little nooks and crannies under the ocean and left them there. Um, and that was, that was just, it was beautiful. It was beautiful for me. And I just, you know, it didn't need to meet the human eye, that they were just there. And, and this photograph in particular, for me to just snorkel around in the area and just watch the fish and the sea slugs. And, you know, I even had, they, they eventually, they got grown over by coral. Um, so, and this was, in, this was in the pathway of the, you know, of the people coming to harvest rock. And so they would have to kind of, when I was floating them at first, they would sort of have to navigate their way around it. Um, and they never really said much, but I became a bit of more of a, like viewed as a, as a crazy person, as a witch <laughs> and somebody up to some weird stuff. Um, but the pieces were starting to get damaged, you know, because there was a lot of activity happening there. And so what I then did was I, I went to the, to the landowners and um, who were, you know, some of them were friends of mine. And I went and asked if the area could become a protected area, not the whole area, because they, of course, they didn't agree to that. So I'd asked if I could just have, I was, in my mind, it was 10 square feet, a little space where I could put these gems and they were safe, just for me and the fish <laughs> and all the other creatures of the ocean. Um, and but I had to do it in a in a kind of in the way of water, because if I were to address this in a you know in the way that I had been in the past, was asking directly, it would not have worked. So I used what I like to call a woman's way or the way of water. And we go, you know, we go like this, <laughs> slow, gentle, and and it worked. So, um, and that, that is a, you know, that's a pretty cool story, but maybe a story for another time. But they did say yes. So I ended up being able to have a sanctuary declared from one creek to the next creek. So that became what's called the Tambu area. And for me, that was huge. I mean, yeah. And that's been maybe eight years now, maybe even 10 years now that it's been declared a sanctuary. Um, 
But six years after, six years after all of that occurred, and so many things in between, um, they sent somebody up from the village to me and came and told me that they had stopped. They had stopped the harvest and then the harvest came completely illegal. So I know that I played a part in that in an indirect way. And so which brings me to the work and the work that I do now. And it is about, a, you know, feeling those traumas, seeing them for what they are, and then seeing beyond that, but then all, almost like um, allowing yourself the space between what you know happened, what is happening in the future, and then what are you going to do in between that may determine what will happen in the future. Um, and for me, that's very much sacred work. Mm. 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 I'm curious if there, so I'm hearing that working in the women's way, mm, mm, um, making suggestions, planting seeds, in, in the minds of the land, in the minds of the, the landowners. Um, was there, were there, were there other converging forces that, that, that were, were probably working simultaneously? You know, you were, you were working uh, towards, um, uh, you know, the, the respect and the, and the, the, the right to life and, and, you know, the gentleness and the kinship. Do you think that there was obviously like a whole series of events that that converged to a get the sanctuary um, defined and b eventually that the coral was um, was that mining it was actually outlawed? Mm, sorry, I'm I'm not. I, I understand. Maybe you might want to rephrase that, Danny. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess I'm. Yeah, I'm curious what other factors were at play, I guess. that That's what I'm curious about. I know for sure what you did played a part. So I'm just curious if you know what other, mm -hmm. what other stakeholders or players, mm -hmm. right? Because those are huge. Like those two things, one to get the sanctuary defined. And there's a sign. Yes, there's a sign for the sanctuary, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, this is official. Like, that's amazing. That's absolutely incredible. And it took almost 10 years before that happened, right? From mm -hmm. the time you were, yeah. So, you know, we talk about women's medicine, the staying power, right? The, the water's way, right? Wearing away the rock um, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And then the other piece about, but coral actually um, digging live rock was outlawed or banned. I'm wondering like who instigated that or, or how did that come about? That's just, I'm just curious about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So we do have um, organizations, conservationists, as I've mentioned before, that work in those realms. And of course they were not for the live rock harvest. And, you know, if we ever had a conversation about it, it is something that they have been, um, trying to stop for many, many years. So they, were, they are obviously, obviously playing their roles in their own way of the way that they operate and the way that they know how. Um, and those people are so important to any community. You know, I'm very much aligned with their, their vision for conservation and regeneration and restoration. Um, so that was obviously had been playing out for however many years. Um, but not my, not my way. You know, I've, I've had conversations about this and oftentimes I um, was told, just let it go. And these are from friends of mine as well. I mean, and not only ones who work in conservation, but just dear friends of mine, artists, who just let it go, let it go. And I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't let it go, but I did let it go in a way where I was no longer torturing myself out there just with that. Um, as you, as we, you mentioned, Tara, in our short conversation before we started, was if you've got something that is a disability, 
or trauma, if you're going to stay stuck in that frequency, it ain't going to move. You're just going to amplify. So I, through the arts, through creating something beautiful out of that and had looking past that and, and working. So the sea gems were not only therapy for me, they became a, they became talismans of protection for the area. I mean, that was my heart. That's what was coming out. That's what, that was my way of artivism, if you may. So we do have a great movement that sort of sweep through the earth, you know, activating against whatever it is. But I just found that for me as my individual person is not in alignment with who I am. I was one of those people at one time, but I had to find something else that was going to nurture my soul and really put me at rest. So the process from, you know, from that first standpoint all the way through the in-between became almost like a dance, you know, of emotions that went up and down. But the beauty in that, you know, it was like an evolutionary process. Um, so I do not claim to have completely stopped the live rock harvest, but I know that I've played a part in it and in a different way you know and just was able to have like this serendipitous outcome for myself and for the ocean and I have had her acknowledge that I mean that just like that in itself that just blew my mind completely so beautiful 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 so a couple of things um, I can echo that I also made the journey from activist, like frontline direct action activist on behalf of um, our beloved trees and logging in BC. And then I moved into when that became un unsustainable for me, I recognized that how can I be promoting sustainability when my own life was not sustainable because I was basically sacrificing everything in order to, to be on direct line front action. So I stopped. I also realized that for myself, when I fought against something, I divided inside. So again, how can I be standing for wholeness and connection when I myself was divided? So I eventually made my own journey and it was water also, water who brought me into the realm of being an advocate so then I journeyed from activist to advocate for water's voice, for water's um, own rights to, to, to live and thrive and evolve. And then gradually, of course, once I began my apprenticeship with the nature elders, I began to, at the end of that, moved into the realm of collaborator or co-creator with the nature elder. So, you know, I think that this is a journey that many of us are making um, uh, as we, I would say, mature almost as human beings and, and begin to understand that love is a, the most powerful force there is. And also that, um, and this relates more to um, what's coming through me for seven days of rest. The listening field is going to be opening uh, daily. Um, to invite the nature elders to uh, help us embody the different essences of each day. But as I was tuning into that, I just keep hearing this call that this year of 2023 is the time that we are meant to bring our unique contribution into form and into function into the new earth, that we're to, to step forward with it. So for me, your story is also exemplifying that you heard a call you felt something, you heard a call, and you acted on that call in precisely the way that only you could do it. No one else was a mosaic artist. No one else was, was feeling what you did. No one else moved to that house. No one else saw that every single day. So your story for me just really exemplifies that I think every one of us has a version of this story and that, that life is really inviting us to take the risk to keep listening, to keep learning as to how to bring what we have into the world so it's going to serve the good of all, right? It's not going to alienate. It's not going to create more separation. So um, beautiful. I just I really love hearing these particular threads. Um, we have a few more photos. Can you share with us a bit about them? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. And then we'll go to some comments because I know this is a topic, uh, the reefs are really popular. So 
what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a lot is going on and a lot has gone on prior to this where we completely surrender, we surrender ourselves to the water. Um, so my, my work now has taken on this beautiful immersion um, that I offer. So I went through a incredibly traumatic experience, as you know, being, being mine. <laughs> and, and so this, this place is, is special because it has been anchored with so much. And when I say anchored, it's not so much that it's a matter of us bringing something new. The, the power is already here. The portals are already here. It's just a matter of um, aligning yourself in a certain frequency to open up the portals. So the sanctuary is a portal. And um, so what I, what I now do is I, I open up the space, particularly for women. It's actually, it's open for all. It's open for all, but women tend to, um, it tends tend to, they have a tendency to allow vulnerability to rise through the surface. And the, everything is energy, just vibrating at different frequencies. And Mother Ocean has the tendency, as, because she is a creative force, to take that, whatever it is, whatever hurts or joy or whatever, to take it and, and do what she will with it and use that energy. It's giving back to her. So... I offer um, return to nature and nurture by nature um, immersions where women come and really get to a place where they can. So they, they might come with some issues. And then what's at the end of that is they come to a celebratory place where they can celebrate all parts of them, even the parts that they, before they arrived here, they don't want to see, they've packed away. And part of that is bringing it all to the ocean and giving, handing it over to her and you know, saying, here, mother, mm. I, I this to you, do what you will with it. Because if you, you know, yes, we know that the earth is female. The earth is a mother that provides us with this amazing place to come from. And mm. what does a mother want most? Mm. Yeah, she wants us, she wants us to return to her. We are her mm. hearts. Whether you're mm. broken, whether you're joyful, you know, just a mother wants her child to come back, rest on her chest and be comforted by her, but to return to her. So we've gone through a process where we've just, we've completely removed ourselves from her. Mm -hmm. She who provides us with absolutely every need and more if you open yourself up to her. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, this happens here in such a beautiful way where we allow ourselves to be broken because we know within that brokenness, that's how the lights get, that's how the light gets in and out and out. Mm. 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 Let's just take a couple of breaths here because that's the... Um... some energetic medicine that you've just shared with us. I feel called to open up the, the room now for people who would either like to comment or to ask you questions. I also just wanted to check. Um, we have one last photo. Um, shall we save that for the very end? Or would you like me to show that one now? It's the one with the... <laughs> Well, now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> okay, let, let's see this beauty. Are you able to zoom in, Danny? Um, if I, not, that's okay. I, I think I can make, whoops, sorry. Um, whoop, whoop, whoop. Let me just come back. I can make it the screen bigger. I think that's the choice that I can make. So let me do that. And oh, I see when I, oh, wait a minute. There, let me just see. All right, this is a little better. How's that? 
Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Um, so this is like the key. And it's, it's just, and I think it's something that's already known, right? So everybody makes offerings of incense or prayers. And, you know, we have different ways of offering our gratitude. And this is, when I say this is the key, um, many of us are seeing the earth through the eyes of um, a body that has been mined or has been extracted from. And really the, the main extraction that is happening is it's us as her children who are being taken away. And these, all of us waking up to our gifts of earth healing is part of that returning home. That's returning home to who we are, is who we truly are. And then these very simple acts of gratitude, like whether you make, whether you offer something under a tree or place a flower like this into the waters, this and not only the action, but the emotion, that's the superpower, is when you make these acts, this is what sets the equilibrium back into the earth. And if you, if you can look around the flower and you, if you really zoom in there, you can see the golden light, but that light is not only golden, it's got every single hue present. And, you know, for me, this is just like, oh, I don't know, it's, it's more than, it's more than, it's more than a feeling, it's so real. And so what I've come to realize is if we see, um, if, we, if we view the earth as, you know, we've created this huge debt by this constant extraction of her minerals and, and, and of ourselves from her, how do we set, how do we set that debt? And I've found that it's the attitude of gratitude. And because gratitude is the currency, is the frequency that for want of a better term, that repays the debt. It just, it really brings us home. We do not only return to her, but we give back energetically. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to practice. And it is received on so many levels. Um, and I, I, I'd asked if we could show that slide right at the end, just to land us, you know, back there. That is like the cherry on top. That's, the super, that's part of the superpowers that we hold is the free will to action, the free will to allow our vulnerability to come through the emotions. The way we're gonna shift is through emotion. You know, language is, there's so many codes in our language. It just makes life, so I feel like I wanna not mind my P's and Q's here, but it makes life so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I am completely with you, completely with you. The, the Water Gratitude Project that I started in 12, 2012 came from a wake up that I had in a moment when I realized that I had been saying thank you to someone who opens a door for me or passes me a pencil or to, to someone hands me some food. And I had never once said thank you directly to water. And it had been responsible for my life and for everything that I had in my life, the clothes on my back, the food that I ate, the shelter over my head, absolutely everything. So it was it was a very beautiful moment because I, I felt I felt horrible. Like I felt really, really badly. And then right in that moment, water was right there. The consciousness of water was right there. And I immediately went to forgiving myself. There was no question water was not judging me for this. But then I, right in that moment, I made this vow that I would always remember every moment my gratitude to water and my intimate relationship with water. And water's consciousness actually bonded with me. And we continue to, to inhabit the same space, I would say. So it's an absolute doorway. And it also, the thing about gratitude that I love too is that it blesses the, the offerant as well as the receiver. It's this 
magical mm -hmm. uh there's a friend of mine who talks about the 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 virtues i think it's esther penner and she calls them there's these feelings that are eternal like they they never they're they're eternal and and gratitude is one of them so is uh, love and i think compassion so thank you so much for landing us on that little yellow flower <laughs> it's so beautiful so I want to open up now to anyone who would like to either comment or ask uh, Tessa a question. God, I really want to call you Teresa. It's really interesting. You might be coming into your Teresa hood. <laughs> I think I'm, yes, right so now I'm with both of them. I'm with both of them. So either one or both <laughs> together. Perfect. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Hillary. Okay. Wow, I just am so um, grateful <laughs> talk about gratitude mm -hmm. um, for this conversation because uh, I sort of immersed myself in, in some documentaries in the last 24 hours on the coral reefs just to re reacquaint myself with this most magical uh, uh, part of the eco of the world's ecos, our planet's ecosystem. And, and any, you know, what you've done in terms of honoring them and letting us honor the beauty of them on the surface rather than having to go down underneath and, and and look at them through your art through the way that you have brought attention to it is so magical and i just love the way you talked about it seems so weird that i've been doing this work for you know over 15 years um and around and that water led me too into this really uh, phenomenal experience of, of becoming and um and how it it i i was a member of a group called ladies of the lake and our first piece of our first offering was a naked calendar that supported our lake that this was lake simcoe here in canada that was was she was dying and rather than talking about all the ills and the and the, and the awful things that were going on and the algae and the invasive species and all those things we did a calendar in which we showed this beautiful relationship between the women and the water in each season. Mm -hmm. And I was really lucky. I got summer. <laughs> so I was in a fish. I was in a fishing boat in a marsh. There were others that did had to do winter and that went on a sled on a, you know, on a dog sled and in a, f a fishing hut um, in the middle of winter. But but what it did was it, it started a different process of understanding the relationship that we have with the lake, that we were that we were honoring it. And we weren't about we didn't make anybody wrong and we didn't make anybody guilt. It was about we are so fortunate to have this most amazing lake. So how can we mobilize action to honor it? And it, we, and our language changed from we were saving to the, the lake to the lake is trying to save us. Mm -hmm. and and that was a huge transition um that that was uh, that was and you did the same kind of thing and i go back to the idea that you know um that c in french is mer m e r which is also mother you ah. add an e and it's mother so the c is 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 such an amazing again the mother of our earth um and 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 her and her waters and so it makes a lot of sense why women's way is the way of water and i and again i just want to acknowledge the idea that you know like bruce lee's quote about water is that uh that we are that like water we find our way in the cracks we find our way around boulders. We find we don't go through. We go around gently. We 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 dance with with uh, you know with the obstacles. We don't crash into them as as much as we dance with them, and that we we become the, the we become that when we are in the teacup we become the teacup, when we are in the we come what we become whatever container and and that that we become water. We become the friend of the earth, and it is just the most wonderful feeling in your art and the way that you caressed and cradled this relationship with water um, is just wonderful, especially now what I know more about the coral reefs. So my question is, what's next for you? Hmm. Thank you. I that was just yeah, it's so beautiful to hear your story and to know that we are so many points of light around the globe, working with water in in such a magical way. Um, and I, I hope that you will, there is a 2023 calendar 
that I may be able to get as well because <laughs> I am intrigued. <laughs> I love it. Um, as far as what's next, um, I just continuing to land back the sacred one footstep at a time, continuing to bring the hearts back home mm. one heart at a time. Um, and I do have a uh, soon to be available online um, immersion through what's called the Empathy Architects. So all of this, all of this sharing through this technology has in the past been a huge issue for me. And I'm just realizing that this is through a great teacher of mine, Chief Phil Lane, he landed the truth that the internet is actually everywhere spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, I mean, so, you know, look at us. We're connecting over the other side of the globe. I'm in the South Pacific. It's early morning here. And, and this is what, um, you know, weaving through different dimensions, la, 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 it goes on and on. So to answer your question, I do the immersions here for anybody who is able to land themselves physically in the space, but I'm also available online. Um, for, and it's not about, I'm not here, I'm not out there and I'm not here to try to fix anything. I'm simply just inviting you back in to come and weave alongside me or float or, you know, start to flower ourselves in this beautiful, amazing garden that we have. So I like to think, actually, Danny and I did a, did a thing on seven days of rest last year called Fertile Ground for Co-Creation. So I am continuing that in a few different ways. Thank you so much, Hilary. It's oh, been, you're, been... you're just wonderful. And your energy is just flowing all over the place. But, but I, I just love, I want to just pick, one thing I've just picked up from you is go from fix to flower. And and what a beautiful transition that is from fix to flower. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Hillary. And Hillary and I co-facilitate the unpacking the messages from the nature elders that we've been receiving in the listening field. So we've been uh, coming up on the 17th of January. We have the seventh in the series of seven. We're unpacking the messages that we receive from the web of life. So again, feels very connected to mm -hmm. what we're um, what we're dipping into or immersing ourselves here. I've put in the chat the link to Tessa's offerings at Empathy Architect. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful young woman, Tulaya from Thailand, who's created this. I uh, received an invitation to participate, and I plan on I'm putting some offerings there when I have a moment to get them together. But it's a beautiful website, and you can read all about there's a couple of offerings that Tessa has there. Um, I also wanted to just close by in inviting you all to the seven days of rest. You have heard us uh, talk about this. And um, let me just hit send for some links. And then I'm going to go back to um, share screen. And um, as I already shared, I'm going to be opening a listening field each day. But there are many, many, many offerings. And if you go to sevendaysofrest.org to the website, you're going to see incredible things uh, very generously offered by people all over the world. There's meditations and wisdom offerings. Um, some of them are live, like the listening field is live. Others are pre-recorded, so you can watch them at your own time. And so in this, the theme this year for seven days of rest is return to essence. And uh, Shelly Ostroff has brought through these beautiful, beautiful essences seven of them and so each day we will invite the nature elders to help us to embody these essences um you can register for the series at the listing field um, dot life um, there's also a facebook event for this i am just updating that listing field page so if it's not there now it will be there within 24 hours and then um of course this is what i had mentioned with hillary that we're doing on january the 17th so i've put some links in the chat and there are um, uh, invite videos to the, the um, seven days of essence. And also there's a mailing list. So if you'd like to stay in touch, um, we offer a Zoom cast next month as well. And uh, on the um, 27th of January, and I'm still discerning who the guest is, but I just wanted to just really express my gratitude to you, um, Teresa. It's, it's Teresa um, for 
Yeah, being you. You are such a gift. I'm so honored to know you. And I plan to be on your side of the world. I am hearing a call from Australia and I get and New Zealand. And if I get that far, I am definitely coming over there to, to participate with you and in one of your immersions uh, and Mother Ocean. So any last words that you would like to say before we, um, we close off and anyone else too, once you speak. Thank you, Danny. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here with all of the wahine. Do we have any gentlemen in the room? I think we are all wahine here. So thank you ladies um, for showing up and being open to hear me and just to be present. It is a gift to have you um, in the space. And I also wanna just very quickly drop into this basket seven days of rest. So I am doing an offering there and I was waiting. I mean, I had the inspiration for it. I was juggling time and not sure when I was going to do it, but I do know now. And I just wanna offer my gratitude for this space for allowing that to come through. It's gratitude. So look out for the day of gratitude. I am not sure what it's going to be, but I think it's going to be, <clears throat> certainly going to be a co-creative space. Um, so just keep your eye on that calendar and, um, yeah, I can't say it's what it's going to be yet. So it's going to be something. And I would love to have you there to participate, to co-create with me. So Beautiful. Thank you. So, so that's much. day four. That's day four is gratitude. So that's January the 4th. So what you can do, all of us can do this, is go to the seven days of rest.org each day, whenever you like, and it will show you all the offerings for that day. And so you can do that on days one to seven and um and you will see what tessa is offering for gratitude on that day and also just to let you know that when you register for the listening field series you can attend one or many it's the same as zoom link um and you're welcome into however many you do so any other comments by anyone if we have a couple of minutes left tara i hope actually i know that whatever the co contribution that each one of us make during mm -hmm. the seven days of rest, or when we're linking in with the nature elders gathered by, gathered together uh, by Danalia, I hope that all of us recognize that we are all part of a greater whole and this wholeness Synthesis is already present, but unity has to be created. So shall we consider that we are creating a greater whole through our knowing and through that which we are aspiring toward? There is a blessing at its gratitude, but it is also the realization of light and love and the power to continue to contribute to a unity that is needed and actually fully present. Mm. So therefore, the gratitude to every contribution and even those with people or birds or the light that shines upon us. God bless. Mm. Mm. If it shines upon us, it has to be replied to by the light that is within us there's never one direction thank you tara thank you thank you oh we have actually one minute is there anyone else here who's been on the call that just feels that they'd like to to put their voice in center raise your hand or unmute yourself if not, it's very, very fine too. I'd just like to bring the Atlantic Ocean. 
That's where I am. Oh, so, let me just know. spotlight you. Just one second. Let's add the spotlight. And can you show us? Yeah. Oh, uh, there's the Atlantic Ocean on the east coast of Canada. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. And of course, this is uh, the Pacific Ocean behind me on the west coast of Canada. I'm on the unceded territory of the, the Quatsino Nation. And this is Quatsino Sound behind me. So. So we have three oceans right here, three aspects of Mother Ocean uh, connected on the screen. So yes, thank you to technology. Thank mm -hmm. you everyone for joining of us who are walking, watching it on the replay and who have been with us live. Um, I will put this up on YouTube uh, within 24 hours. And of course it's, it's live streaming on Facebook. So thank you so much. Happy new year to everyone and see you at the seven days of rest. Manaka, thank you everyone. Beauty into your day, into your Thank evening. You. Much love.